song. <laughs> but I say, you can sing this song all year. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell, Go tell it, it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that Jesus Christ is born. The little baby Jesus little babe was born on Christmas Day. A bright star in the heavens in the sky gave light to show the way. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds gathered round him, round this child on Christmas hay. Three wise men brought him present him gifts that glorious Christmas day. Go tell, Go tell it, it on the tell mountain, it on the mountain over, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell, Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Spread the news. Go Jesus Christ is born, that Jesus Christ is born. Thank you, Dave. season of epiphany that was a great song yeah it's a wonderful praise song <laughs> oh you know there's just something about jesus that draws you to him when you give him a, a fair hearing when you listen to one of his parables when you read about him in the gospel when you maybe listen to a Christian praise song or something on the radio about Jesus, when you watch an episode of The Chosen, I don't know, however you come in contact with Jesus, there's just something about him that kind of attracts you, isn't there? It just kind of draws you to him. There's something magnetic about Jesus. Well, the Gospel of Mark does a very good job of capturing that allure of Jesus. Allure, the quality of being powerfully and mysteriously attractive or fascinating. Doesn't that sum up Jesus? He is powerfully and mysteriously magnetic. He's fascinating. There's just something about him. Of course, we know he's the son of God. That's part of it. But uh, it's really neat. Mark is the shortest and the fastest paced of the four Gospels. He quickly presents Jesus as a young man on the move. Their action is intense. The need is urgent. There's no need for genealogy or the Christmas birth stories, okay? Just start with his herald, John the Baptist, proclaiming the imminent arrival of God's Messiah. That's how Mark begins his gospel. Jesus is baptized by John, and then he goes off into the wilderness for 40 days to plan out his ministry. While there, Jesus is tempted by the devil, but he resists all the temptations. And then Jesus bursts onto the scene in Galilee and begins preaching. Let's see what he starts with. Later on, after John was arrested, 
Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. Jesus has actually already been preaching for some time. This is where Mark begins the story, okay? So John is already arrested, um, and, and then Jesus comes to Galilee and begins his preaching. The time promised by God has come at last, Jesus announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe in the good news. Now that sounds like a preacher, doesn't it? Jesus has a message to share, and it's not just words to fill up an hour, but a message that can make a real difference in people's lives, okay? A message that has the power to heal, a message that can make people whole. Jesus has a real message to share, and people take notice. They listen. They talk. Some people are curious. Some are expectant. Honestly, some are skeptical. Others are excited. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew. He's already met him. You remember Andrew was one of them who was there at his baptism, right? And John said, oh, follow him. And Andrew went, and he introduced Peter to Jesus. You remember all that. We talked about that last week. They've already met. But one day, um, Mark says, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. There's just something about Jesus. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John. They were in a boat repairing their nets. He's probably met them too. He called them at once, and they also followed, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Dad, got to go. <laughs> There's just something about Jesus. Everybody was noticing. There was something about him that drew others toward him. Maybe it was his compassion. Maybe it was the, the grace in his eyes. I don't know. Maybe it was the tone of his voice, strong and commanding and yet gentle and inviting. Maybe it was the way he looked, calm and peaceful, or the way he moved, quick and purposeful. Maybe it was the way that when you talked to Jesus, you had his full attention. But there was just something about him that attracted people to him. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. You know, wherever Jesus went, large crowds of people followed him. So come Sabbath, okay, they followed him to Capernaum. Come Sabbath, uh, the, the, the sanctuary is filled with tourists. It had to have been a great Sabbath. Um, when Sabbath day came, he went to the synagogue and he began to teach. For he, um, the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught with real authority. Quite unlike the teachers of religious law that they were accustomed to. You know, the church in Jesus' day was, well, it, it was church, <laughs> you know. I, I mean... Uh, the people of God were coming to hear God's word for their lives. Some old scribe would come forward. He'd take a scroll. He'd start reading. It was ritualistic, which is not a bad thing at all. We have rituals. It was predictable, which admittedly can get a little dull quickly. It was dry. It was, dare we say, boring. It was church, right? Nothing unusual happened. Nothing surprising very little interesting. And then Jesus came. He was a, a visiting rabbi. They invited him to speak. He read. He taught. And it was somehow different. It was so different, in fact, that the people were hanging on every word. Jesus uh, astounded them. He was engaging. He was passionate. He was interesting. It was a welcome surprise to the people in Capernaum. I grew up in a church uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. It was actually it was called St. Paul United Methodist Church on the corner of 
Euclid and Rozell. Um, it's, it's not there anymore. But I grew up in a church that, that had good pastors. I remember several of them very fondly. Um, we called our pastors brother. Until I went to college, I didn't even know women could be pastors because I grew up in the South. We called them all brother. It was Brother Stavely and Brother Mishke and Brother Gallimore. I didn't know there were any, you know, sisters that could do it. <laughs> I didn't know that. But we had good pastors. I remember them very fondly. But I always evaluated the quality of the service for the day by the brevity of the sermon. <clears throat> that was the hardest part of the service for me. I was a visual learner in a day when we didn't have any screens to look at, okay, I didn't have anything to kind of hold my attention for a moment. I had a lot of energy, and I had a short attention span. Oh, look at that car. <laughs> no, um, not a lot has changed. I don't know. <laughs> Squirrel. So the sermon for me was the worst part of the service. You do see the irony here, don't you? I would sit as quietly as I could beside my grandparents, um, usually my grandmother, and I would look through her purse. You ever do that, kids? I would look through her purse for gum or mints or, you know, a fidget spinner, <laughs> anything that, that would help pass the time. No, we didn't have fidget spinners back then. Anyway, that's, that's how I experienced church during my childhood. It was a welcoming place. It was a fun place. We sang good songs. We learned the stories of Jesus. And you had to sit still for what seemed like forever. I went off to college. I found a, a great little church to worship in, and I went every week. Um, it was in St. Louis. It was called University United Methodist Church. It's the church where Howard and I were married in. It was a great church. I loved it there. Um, but it really wasn't much different, you know. Good pastors, but the sermons were still hard for me to sit through. And then the first sin Sunday of my fall year came. Uh, the first Sunday of the fall came of my junior year. I was a junior at, at Wash U. And, and I went to church on that first Sunday, and, and the church had gotten a new pastor um, during the summer. And, and I went, as was my custom, to church not expecting too much because, well, it was church. But for the first time in my young life, I heard a pastor who was actually a good preacher. No, I, I'm being serious. His sermon was amazing. It grabbed my attention and held it. And before I knew it, 30 minutes had passed. It was amazing. The pastor was well-spoken. He had a good sense of humor. He told the stories of the Bible in a way that I had never heard him told, where the people were like real people with real issues. And he talked about Jesus like he knew him. And it just attracted me to Jesus. I was amazed at his preaching. There is something so powerful about people who speak with authority, whose message is as much from the heart as it is from the mind. And what I noticed about Bruce, my friend, Pastor Bruce Davis, he's also the pastor that married us. What I noticed about Bruce is akin to what I suspect those people in Capernaum noticed about Jesus. There was just something different about him. Jesus was engaging. He was passionate. He was interested. He really seemed to know what he was talking about, and it was a welcome surprise. And the people were astounded by his teaching. Those people in Capernaum were glad they had come to church that day. I mean, wow, what a Sunday, right? Oh, but the servant wasn't over. The service wasn't over yet. There was more to come. Jesus has spoken with authority, but it caused a bit of a crisis. It seems one of the churchgoers that day had a demon inside him. I wonder how many other services the man had attended without revealing that he was demonized? Because <laughs> the words of the preacher didn't bother him at all, right? I wonder how many other services that he attended. But when Jesus spoke the word of God with such authority, interpreting the scriptures to the people and inviting them to live in a new way, well, that was very threatening to the demon. And look at these next verses. I mean, really, the guy should have just been quiet. But suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit began shouting, 
Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One sent from God. Well, that's quite a little witness, isn't it? Can I get a witness? <laughs> I'm not thinking that's quite the kind of witness Jesus was looking for. Now, I do want you to notice that the demons recognize Jesus, even when the pious folks can't figure him out. Joel Marcus cleverly points out that it would have been much smarter for the demon to keep a low profile. But the demons in the Gospel of Mark, all throughout the Gospel, they seem to have this kind of fatal attraction for Jesus. You know, where they can't help it. They're just kind of drawn to him. And, oh, Jesus, what do you want with us? Leave us alone, buddy. We're not bothering you. And he casts them out, you know. The demon asks Jesus in the synagogue in Capernaum why he's meddling, you know. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet. Come out of the man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Well, if you thought the people were awed by Jesus before, what do you think they thought of that? You know? Jesus is awesome. He resists temptation with authority. He preaches with authority. And Jesus even silences and banishes demons with authority. Let's talk about the word for a minute that Jesus shouts to the demon. Um, I don't know Greek, but you can kind of look up commentaries on these words. And Jesus, never as tame and mild as we picture him, uh, says to those invisible forces of evil, to, the, to that demon, he says, be quiet or hush. But the Greek word Jesus uses here, uh, phimotheti, is actually more coarse. It's sort of a slang. It's more like, shut up. Or, shut your trap, you know? <laughs> I like that. Uh, that's the Greek, okay? But, but why does Jesus shout like that to the demon? Why does he silence the demon? And it occurs to me that God often invites silence, doesn't he? Be still and know that I am God, says the psalmist in Psalm 46. Jesus stills the cool, the calms the storm, actually using the same word. So I don't know if he's yelling shut up to the wind and the rain, but um, be still, peace. Remember the quiet that Elijah, the prophet, heard after the storm on Mount Horeb. I think God likes to quiet things down sometimes. My point is that the racket of the world is, well, it's racket, right? The noisy rancor of political ideology and dissension. The clamor of marketers trying to get you to buy this or buy that. The hollering in your head that you're just not good enough, that you shouldn't be here, that nobody cares. There are certainly times, even today, when people find themselves in the grip of something unhealthy and unholy. Maybe it's a demon. Maybe it's a, a spirit that robs life of its joy. Maybe it's an addiction or something that keeps everything under control, tied down, neat and safe and lonely and doesn't let you live the life that Jesus died to empower you to have, you know. There are things that bind us still. We can name a lot of loud, angry spirits that clamor around in our heads, can't we? There's a lot of racket going on around us almost constantly. And wouldn't it be great if Jesus would just calm that storm for us, you know, just quiet those voices, silence the racket, you know what? Jesus can. Jesus invites every one of us to be healed by his authority. This morning, all I want to say is if you need help with something, just ask Jesus, and he will help you. Trust me, walking with Jesus liberates you. 
Jesus has, after all, come to set us free, right? We know that. If you're in bondage from anything, ask help from the only authority who can free you. Back to our story, um, Jesus tells the demon to shut up and come out of the man. The demon tries one last convulsive attack, but then he has to submit to Jesus' authority. And watch the, look at the crowd's response, okay? Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. I mean, everybody's noticing Jesus now, right? The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. I don't think it would take very long, right? For news like that, you will not believe what the visiting preacher did today in our church. You will not believe what happened. Word about Jesus travels quickly, and people are drawn to him. There's just there's something about Jesus. It's, it's hard to put a name on it. Um, you and I know, of course, that he's the son of God. He's the savior of the world, and that is amazing. But there's still something, before we even have received Jesus and Lord and Savior, as Lord and Savior, there's still something that kind of draws us toward him. There's something about the man. Maybe it's a different facet of his person or his personality that attracts different people. I know one of the main things for me that drew me to Jesus was his compassion. I was always amazed, even as a child, as I read the stories, Jesus had compassion for the crowds. I look at crowds and see a sea of people. Jesus looked at crowds, looked at crowds and he saw individuals who needed to know that God loved them and cared about them and wanted to free them for joyful obedience and love. It, it, I love the compassion of Jesus Maybe it was his compassion. Maybe it was the grace in his eyes. Maybe it's the tone of his voice, strong and commanding, yet gentle and inviting. Maybe it's the way he looked. He was calm and peaceful. Maybe it was the way he moved. It was quick and purposeful. Maybe it was the way you had his full attention when you were talking to him or the healing that you received when he touched you or you touched him. What is it? that draws you to Jesus? Or to put, it, to put it another way, what is one of the things that you like most about Jesus? The yellow roses on the altar today come from the service yesterday for Teresa Johnson. Beautiful soul. She helped us with our rummage sale. She passed away in January from cancer. On one of my visits with Teresa in the hospital, I asked her. This was just about a week before she died. I was visiting her at Barnes. She was in Parkview. And I said, Teresa, let's refocus for a minute. We'd been visiting about her situation. I said, tell me something about Jesus that you like. She said, I love his mercy. You might not think that somebody going through the pain and the trial that she was just a week from going home would be focusing on the mercy of Jesus Christ, you know? You think they'd be angry, you think they'd be scared, you think they'd be lamenting, you think they'd be sad. She was focusing on the mercy of Jesus Christ. One of the things I admired most about Teresa was the courage with which she made this final leg of her earthly journey. Very brave, very faithful, very courageous, very loving, always upbeat, and smiled every time you walked in the room. That's a pretty real faith, wouldn't you say? It's a pretty empowering faith, don't you think? Her faith was rooted in the goodness of God. It was rooted in the light of grace of Jesus Christ and his mercy and compassion. And Teresa saw it, and she felt it, and she lived in it 
and under the authority of Jesus all of her life. That's our calling, you know. Discover him while you're young. Walk with him all your days. Go home with him in the end. That's our calling. That's the plan. I am amazed by Jesus. I, I find him alluring. He is powerfully and mysteriously fascinating. And I do wonder how we might be an amazing church. If Jesus was amazing back then in Capernaum, maybe Jesus now, Jesus now is, is the body of Christ, his church in the world. If Jesus was amazing then, maybe Jesus now can be amazing. Maybe Jesus now, uh, his churches can be astounding in their worship, attractive through their fellowship, compassionate in their community ministries, authoritative in their teaching, powerfully inviting in their witnessing, and outstanding in their service. Can I get an amen? You haven't fallen asleep on me, have you? What might that look like? an astounding church. You know, in closing, all the statistics tell us that people are looking for something, right? They're still searching. People are looking for what it means to live a real, authentic, joyful existence here on earth. Many people would like to find an attractive church. What are they looking for? Oh, all the things that bring people to a church for a visit anyway. Some are curious, some are expectant, some are skeptical, others are excited. But do they discover the alluring Jesus when they come? Do they feel accepted and welcomed? Do they hear in the message the words about a Savior that can make a real difference in their lives? A message that has the power to heal and to make people whole? Do they experience a welcoming fellowship where they can kind of picture themselves fitting in and, and finding friends and, and being happy and, and maybe doing a mission project or two together? You know, I, I want to be a part of that kind of church. Don't you? One where our devotion to Jesus and our passion for welcoming and serving others cannot be denied, even by our critics, because our acts of mercy and justice are just so obvious. In closing, I, I don't know if I put it up there or not. I think I have it. Yeah, it's a quote from St. John. I misspelled John. It's a quote from St. John Chrysostom. He was the Archbishop of Constantinople in the 4th century A.D. So he's one of the early church fathers, okay, one of the early Christians, early church leaders, and he has this amazing quote. I really like this. He was a very good preacher. Um, he was a very good preacher. He says, let us astound them by our way of life. That is the unanswerable argument. Amen? That is great. Thank you, St. John Chrysostom. Let us, uh, let us astound them by our way of life. This is the unanswerable argument. Though we give 10,000 precepts, in words, if we don't exhibit a far better life, we gain nothing. Let us win them by our life. I like that. That sounds about right. I told you earlier in the month that my goal this year is for us to double in size. We have a lot of work to do. We're worshiping at about, uh, I haven't figured out the average yet for last year. I, I, I'm going to guess around 75, 80. Okay, that'll put us about 150. We have a lot of witnessing to do. Let's win them by our life, by the way we are together. Let's pray. Oh, gracious and loving God, Bring the people that you want to be here, bring them here. 
we don't want to grow because it's a numbers game, Lord. We want to grow because we know that there are people who need to be here, who, who, need, who need to find you, Jesus, who need to be welcomed into the family of God. Help us to find them. Help us to reflect well your grace and compassion and love and justice to our community. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right, our closing song. I told you we'd throw this one at you again. <laughs> it's a beautiful song, beautiful song. Um, so we're going to sing King of Kings, Stand If You Will. We have even had the choir practicing it. So, so choir is out there sitting amongst you. Just sing loud and proud. Just try to get the hang of this song. It's a beautiful song, and we'll sing it again in December, if not before. <laughs> In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes, to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory, to a cradle. a hand. That's pretty good, church.
That's pretty good, church. Thank you, Bev. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Let's join in our benediction. I do want to remind you before we leave, we have a, a confirmation information meeting. If you're still pondering whether or not you want to do this, you're welcome to join us in the fellowship hall about 1015. Um, so we'll see you then. And do we have Sunday school for little kids? Yes, we've got Sunday school for little kids down in our little children's room. Um, if you need to know where that is, it's downstairs and to the right. What? 102. Thank you. All right. Let's join in our benediction. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people because all people are God's people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.